Welcome to the Wisdom Check by Tabletop to Keyboard. This is going to be our bi-weekly podcast where we discuss things such as Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, I think maybe we need to turn up my mic a little bit, guys. How about some more game? More game. This is the Wisdom Check! This is the intro to end all intros. Talk about Dungeons, Dragons, and Dungeons. Now, now, I don't think that's proper. This is a family show, after all. This is the intro we can use, fellas. It's good, clean fun for everyone. Welcome to the Wisdom Check, where we have wholesome conversations about the dilemmas we face every day. Nah, nah hold on a second. I got your intro right here. Yeah, that's better. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Well, I'm right, just wrong. We're going to have guests on to talk about it. It's going to be awesome, because I said so. He is right. He did say so. I don't know. Is surf music the best music for a podcast about D&D? Fuck yeah. Okay. This just in. Nobody can agree on our intro for this podcast. So we're just going to start. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Roll for initiative. Fuck. A one. It's like every time. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this week's Wisdom Check. I'm Dustin. This is Jeff. With us today is Naravia from Naravia TV. Naravia is an MMO player, and on Wednesdays on her channel, you can find her playing in the Curse of Strahd 5e game. And so we welcome her here today on the Wisdom Check, where we're going to talk a little bit um, about her experiences as a gamer, how she got into gaming from MMOs, and how that transition has gone, and then also uh, talk a little bit about how to write character backgrounds and encouraging some role play at the table. So... It's going to be a fun one. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here. Thanks Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Awesome. So yeah, we were saying we're uh, we're curious, you know, about what you do. And the Curse of Strahd is a is a pretty interesting one. Uh, You know, it's a horror genre. It's a very uh, unique kind of setting. Uh, It's I don't know. I I love the art style from that one back in the day. You know, and it's kind of translated up through. So like, what what drew you to that one in particular? Uh, So we actually started with. the the death house like mini module just because we were looking for something that was really good for beginner players so we have Mm -hmm. um a very beginner dm and a very beginner group so we were looking for just something small we were a little intimidated by going for a full campaign to start with Mm -hmm. so we just did the death house module Mm -hmm. and we had so much fun we actually one of our characters actually died unfortunately but uh, it's a right of passage a lot of fun yeah the the swamp monster guy got him um (laughs) but uh luckily he was uh revived afterwards Mm -hmm. so uh we finished that module and then we were just like i want to see how this goes so i don't know if our dm had this whole plan in mind or not but basically like Strahd came down and like talked to us and basically just told us we were pawns in his game and (laughs) we uh you know we just decided to go forward with it so it's not the campaign I would have ever thought that I would have picked Mm -hmm. but uh you know we just decided to go with it it was what was on your plate yeah you know Ravenloft has a certain feel to it like if you take the different D&D like what they call box settings Mm -hmm. you know there's there's Greyhawk there's Dragonlance there's um, Forgotten Realms and then, you know, Ravenloft. Ravenloft is very different than the mm-hmm. other, like, four or five. Um, you know, it's very horror setting, like, almost like the intent of Ravenloft is it's such a different game. Mm-hmm. So, right. like, do you feel like you get those horror elements out of the Ravenloft game so far? Like, um, So, I'm generally pretty, like, I don't gravitate towards horror games or anything like that, but... Mm-hmm. I've definitely feel I've felt afraid. I have felt like there's like so our DM also inlays like music and like nice. soft voice sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it really sort of like 
can make things feel really tense. And you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? <laughs> and then all of a sudden a bunch of vampires pop out. And you're like, ah! So yes, I feel like I get that um, from this campaign. I feel like there's mm-hmm. a lot of suspense. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know that it... So when I think horror, I also think gore. And I don't oh, get okay. that. Mm-hmm. But I definitely get this sort of um, classic vampire feel from the game. I mean, yeah, he's he's kind of like Count Dracula. You know, yeah. He's, yeah. he's the Dracula of D&D. So yeah, right. you get that sort of feel from him. Yeah, it should be a little right. Victorian, a little bit uh, Castlevania kind of style. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. I do like that. And I, I feel like it, uh, it It just has a really good look. So Yeah, it's, it's got a nice aesthetic to it. So you were saying you're kind of a new gamer, right? So, uh, you know, in terms of D&D in particular, obviously, it sounds like you've been playing MMOs for a very long time. But uh, yes. <laughs> how, how new are you? Uh, so we actually just hit our one year of playing D&D. Um, nice. we, Congratulations. We started one year ago. Um, we did have to take, um, I think we stopped playing for two months uh, around last fall um, when the new expansion for WoW came out. We stopped our campaign <laughs> for a couple uh, of months. Damn WoW. Um, yeah. And then we also <laughs> took a pretty good size break around December. We didn't play for about a month. Um, That's but fun to happen. other than that, we've been meeting weekly. We only play two hours a week. So we're incredibly slow and being new players, um, <laughs> it's been a very, very slow learning curve for us, but um, we're getting there. So that's how everyone starts. And, and though I will, I am super envious of being able to play weekly. Like oh, weekly, we wish what? we could once uh, a month, once every six. We, we really months. try for every other week or so, but okay. sometimes we, if we miss a game, it's like a month before we get to play again. Yeah. So we're, gotcha. we're always gotcha. super envious of the people who have a regular schedule. Yeah. So we pack like five, six hours into one session, but mm-hmm. you know, very we're, infrequent we're, nowadays. Yeah. We are playing back to back this week. We played last Saturday. We get to play this Saturday, so it's like a special, special occasion for us. We get to play, so. Okay, <laughs> nice. Yeah, we we decided that weekly was best for us because mm-hmm. none of us really. So that was a, a big obstacle for a lot of us wanting to play D and D. As you hear about people, yeah, I spent my entire Saturday playing D and D. I played for twelve hours. I'm like. Mm-hmm can't do it i don't have the attention span for it (laughs) so um we decided all all of our group um we decided that we would just meet weekly and we would just do two hours which is Mm -hmm. most people are like you play for two hours how do you how do you do anything in two hours well we don't (laughs) we don't do anything in two hours but uh it works for us so that we can we can meet weekly and we can um you know have have that time and and Otherwise, it would be we would never be able to do um, six, seven hour sessions like nobody really has that that time slot availability. Mm -hmm. We do because we play so late at night. And we play so rarely that when we play, we we play for some of our game sessions are five hours longer. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, Gotcha. So as an MMO player, you play a hunter in WoW. And so then this is typically what happens when people come from the video game kind of genre into the tabletop gaming genre is they they kind of follow that same pathway in so you're playing a ranger yeah <laughs> you've got a you've got a ranger with a pet and yep. you've got a bow and you shoot things and your pet goes hunter. and attacks you're nice. just playing that just sounds... like you would your wow character and, and that's, that's no right. problems with that at all but it is it's always interesting to me to see people take that familiar mm-hmm. path in yeah because you feel like you know what you're doing and you've been doing yeah. that for like 10 years right and wow exactly. so you're like i know what i'm i can play this i know what i'm doing yep. so your first campaign, you probably spend a fair amount of time just learning the rules, yeah. learning how your shooting works, how your pet works, what it can do, what you can do. And then in the midst of all this, a lot of people in their first first game experience, they don't think too much about the role play part of it. They're, mm-hmm. they're trying to figure out on round to round, how do I move X, Y, and Z to here or there? Mm-hmm. And can I you're, do this? You're, can I do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, what can I do? Like, you know, oh, how does that work? You know, so you're learning rules. There's a lot to learn when you first start in D&D. So you get a halfway into your Christmas broad, and now you're kind of thinking like, I want to role play it a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? You'd be like, I need a, now who's my character? You know, what's my background? Like, how do these things work? And when you're in a module type setting, sometimes the background gets kind of pushed away because the story is in a book. Your DM's using that book. Everything's in there. It's not going to contain it necessarily wrote from your background. Right. You'd have to work really hard to take the little pieces and find ways to insert it into that story. Mm-hmm. You get those kind of situations. When you're in a homebrew game like what we run, our DM Levi spends hours going through and figuring out how he's weaving our stories into oh, one story because okay. we don't have mm-hmm. we don't have that initial book to work out of. He's, right, he's doing okay. it all on his own. He's mm-hmm. he's been an overtime work for us, you know. So it's Definitely. so w- when we get around here to start to talk about character background, 
you know, it's what you'll have to do is, is um, you'll have to think about how your background can apply to the game module that you're going into. In your case, now you're in Curse of Strahd and Ravenloft. You know, we talked a little bit about those themes of horror and stuff like we can we can work with you a bit here and we'll help you even right here live, maybe on the air, like help you <laughs> put some ideas into your into your uh, into your background. So we'll... Yeah, it's something that I really wanted to get more into. So like you said, when you start the module, you just go mm -hmm. like right. you just follow along. And maybe the only role play that I've ever really done so far, it plays off of my favorite enemy or my mm -hmm. outlander or like the really I basically. Like I made my character, I'm like, she's a tabaxi from the mountains and her name is Cloud on the Mountain mm -hmm. and she's right. from a nomadic tribe and her favorite enemy is undead because mm -hmm. I knew we were doing an undead campaign. Smart play, smart play. You know, that's a little bit metagaming. Now I know that that's metagaming and I wouldn't be allowed to do that it's, again, it's, it's, but you know... It's uh, uh, you know, it's cheating for sure, but it, it, that's as then, far as I've gotten with any kind of role play. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd really like to flesh out my character a lot more now, and mm -hmm. and really get into that, and really maybe get to know who my character is and how she would relate. Um, and currently, I play my character a lot like I would play myself. I picked her alignment to be something mm -hmm. that I thought would be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I'd love to do like a an all evil like murder hobo game like that would be super fun <laughs> but um right now i mean it's it's sort of a it's a difficult thing with our group because most of us are at worst neutral aligned we're mostly mm -hmm. like like i'm chaotic good most of us are some sort of good or neutral alignment and we have mm -hmm. one sort of more evil aligned character and sometimes it really messes with things and it can be yeah. it can be difficult <laughs> Yeah, evil so, characters rarely I'm usually fit. that guy. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> uh, I can see with a more experienced group, you would it could work, you know. But with us, it it's it hard. sometimes yeah. makes things difficult, and it can create division in the group. Basically, yeah, yeah it's sure. very. I don't know difficult if I told to you guys this, but we have um, we have seven players plus a DM plus my wolf Ooh. plus Irina. So, yeah, that's why you don't get anything done. That's why we, <laughs> uh, we started with four. And then it was like, hey, guys, can I join? Hey, guys, and you know, can I too? Hey, guys. And you know how she tolerates it so well? Because I watch a lot of her games live when I can. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes when I'm getting home from work, I'll catch the last half hour of it. Yep. She spends a lot of time being very, very um, interactive with her stream chat when she's streaming. Mm -hmm. So she's spending a lot of time having conversations with people while her DM and other players are talking in her ear. Yeah. And I can hear them, you know, on the stream somewhat mm -hmm. sometimes, but a lot of times I'm hearing her talking to me or talking to other people as we're, we're chatting on stream. So, and we'll get to, we'll get to that too. Cause I'm, I'm thinking that might be something we have to focus on a little, if you're going to do the role play part, cause it's really hard right. to have yeah. conversations and not be maybe it's hearing actually, everything going on there. So <laughs> yeah, it's something I've actually been trying to tone down a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Cause going back and watching my stream, I'm like, uh, it's it's hard for people to understand both. So something it I've is. taken to is actually typing in chat mm -hmm. instead right. of talking out loud. So if somebody is just sitting there with the the not watching, but they're just listening to the mm -hmm. the stream, then they can not, they can follow along without me interrupting it. So it's mm -hmm. been something that's really different for me. When I'm playing a single player game, I can stop whatever I'm doing and, and talk to chat. Mm -hmm. But when right. I'm playing D and D. The game is is first, and that's um, something I've been focusing on more and more. And I, that's exactly I want to tie in more role playing. Mm -hmm. I want people to watch the entire game, and it's a little different on Twitch to stream something like that. But yeah. it's something yeah, that it I want to move towards. Okay, yeah. so we'll see if we can uh, give you some pointers today. Help you help you work your way towards that, that a little bit. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. So I mean, first and foremost, I mean, size that. A party of that seven people plus a DM. Like that's that's two parties. <laughs> it's huge. Yes. So, no, it doesn't leave a lot of room on the stage for an actor, right? So, yeah. like, that may be part of it. Some of it's being online. Um, you know, just even having a conversation with three people on here, you can see that yeah. there's, there's a balancing act of trying to figure out when to talk, when to lay back, and, you know, where people are going to start an end to finish a sentence, you know? So, I, I find for me, that's definitely something that kind of makes the role playing part a little bit more challenging. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, with the modules we were talking about, like you're, you're doing a specific game. Uh, did, did you get any kind of primer ahead of time? Like, Hey, here's what the world is. Here's who's in it. Nope. You know, anything like nope. that? 
So it was so, literally just like, here's your character sheet, go. <laughs> it was basically, um, yeah, when we did um, when we did the uh, module, the small module for Death House, we just mm -hmm. basically, we spent one session making characters, and then we just jumped right into it. We knew gotcha. nothing about it. We literally knew nothing. It was like, you were teleported into this misty woods. No. Oh. And, and that is honestly how Ravenloft always begins. Yep. It seems that's, that way, yeah. that's all that the happened. We started out, we were... Yep. The mist grab you and drop you right into Barovia. And that's... that's exactly what happened. <laughs> and we had no idea what was going on. We didn't know what the name of our campaign was, even. Our DM's very mm -hmm. good at hiding everything. Mm -hmm. Like, um, he didn't even want to tell us the name of the book that we were going to be playing through. Uh, yeah. So, and he's uh, very, very, like, don't metagame. Don't look mm -hmm. anything up. Don't do anything. Right. So, don't like, score. I don't even watch, I don't watch anybody else's Curse of Strahd streams. I've never looked up anything to do with Curse of Strahd. If mm -hmm. you're watching my stream, you'll see me encounter something and I'm using Primeval Awareness. So, I'm like, is this undead? I don't even know <laughs> what this, I don't know what it is. I have no idea. I just see a picture and I don't even know that this is a vampire. So that <laughs> was, I mean, we had to learn these things along the way. And then we're like, weird, he's healing every time we attack him. Why is that happening? Um, <laughs> so for us, it's been really awesome as new players to explore these things for the first time. And it's been really special, I will say. It's been really special. Um, it's not like somebody was like, here, this is the book we're going to be using. Flip through it. And then you, you would know all the monsters, you would know all the places you're going, you'd right. be able to see a map. Yeah, definitely. We're not don't doing want to do any that. of that stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're yeah. exploring things completely blind and it's been really fun. So I will say yeah, that. And that that's one of the things I love watching about your stream when you play D D. And there's a couple other streams I I specifically watch them because they're all brand new. Yeah. And I love watching new players experience things because they they you guys all often not know what you're dealing with. And so you don't make what we consider to always necessarily be the right move. And sometimes, sometimes that really leads bad. to that leads to fantastic outcome. Oh yeah, you know yeah. it's sometimes in, and that's not always you don't always see like I said like we're going to talk about maybe as heavy a role play like mm -hmm. when those things happen. But man, just watching the actions people decide to take and that sudden moment of oh crap, what just happened? Like <laughs> you know it, those are always great, and I love watching new players play the game really for the first time. So it's always Definitely. fun. So so what's motivating you to want to get into the more role play side of things? Um, I watch other people do it and it looks really fun. <laughs> um, and I just, when I think of D and D, I think of role playing. I think mm -hmm. of you step away from who you are and you become somebody else for a few mm -hmm. hours. And I really want to get into that. I gravitate towards, um, I don't know if I should say, I gravitate towards characters. So right now mm -hmm. I'm playing the Witcher three. I yeah. want to be Geralt. And I, I make decisions that Geralt, I think Geralt would make. You know, I mm -hmm. really want to get into that with D&D &D as well. I want to become my character and really, really do what I think they would do and have a set of guidelines and, you know, have fun with it, you know? Definitely, definitely. You know, like, and I, I think the motivation, sometimes you get people that are like actors, like that have that kind of backstory to them as a pro yeah. player. I don't know if you have any of that experience in your, your toolbox, but no. uh, I definitely did not. And so like my closest thing was when we got into LARP, you know, live yeah. action role playing. That's where we kind of developed our role playing chops, I would say. And we, we've nice. talked about that on previous uh, wisdom checks, but I, I think that's really where we kind of broke out a little bit. And, and I'll tell you, the first couple of times I got into like a role play, a heavy game. Yeah. Oh, man, that is awkward. <laughs> you know, you're shy, <laughs> you're nervous, you don't know, you don't what, really you're know what you're doing. You, yeah. know, you feel silly kind of playing a part, you know, you haven't figured out your voice, you haven't figured out your mannerisms, yeah. you know, like what your thoughts are going to be like and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think that's uh, when we're talking about backstories, right? This is kind of where a lot of players put a lot of energy, you know, when they first start to yeah. develop into this. And it makes sense, you know, when you think of uh, stories, you know, you think of like who these players are or characters, I should say, not players. <laughs> but we, we look at the, who those characters are. We figure out where they've been, what they've done. And there are some things that are valuable about a backstory. And there's other stuff that's just filler. And I think that's where people have difficulty kind of figuring out which one's which. Yeah. So like, I I, yeah, I know when I was first starting off, like I would write just pages and pages of just like 
stuff. You know, like it would be like, oh yeah. And then I did this and this cool thing happened. Oh yeah. And then I met the prince and like all this happened and I was like special in this way. And then like I won this duel and it was awesome, you know, and I'm like a totally cool character. And then the game starts and I'm like, and now we're hanging out in a pub fighting a goblin. Hmm. How does any of this matter now? <laughs> yeah. So like some of it is trying to just figure out where you fit in the game world and being okay. realistic about your first level character. You know, the yeah. story is your story, you know? And so the backstory should be more of just how did you get to the start? You know, what okay. people are in your world that matter to you? What things are kind of influencing the way you think or the way you uh, interact with other people? I think those are the things that I've, I've come to find are the most useful. Okay. I don't know so if you like playing off your alignment a bit and sort of like, but would you need to know, so like for our Curse of Strahd campaign, mm -hmm. um, you kind of get dumped into Barovia. So you have no, um, something I guess, so I don't know if it would be something like this. So something I say, like I make my character um, particularly, uh, I like the Vistani a lot because they drink a lot of wine, which is <laughs> in my character's flaws, that mm -hmm. she, an alcoholic, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and she was nomadic. So she, I feel like she has this affinity towards nomadic, uh, you know, peoples. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing that I've really been able to sort of try to work from, like as far as a backstory. So would that mm -hmm. be like a good starting point for fleshing out her background a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, uh, with with your particular scenario, the world that you came from is gone. So like all the connections are missing, like right. they're not going to carry through. Uh, but having those connections are important. You know, like who, who was important in your life? And why is it important now? Because there are going to be new characters that come into the picture that may or may not reflect some of those past relationships. Okay. Or in your case, you're talking about having a uh, interest in, you know, nomadic people oh. and kind of drinking and stuff. So what's the thinking behind it? Like, what is the um, the common thread that you're getting out of those two things that appeals to that character and where maybe do those start? Okay. So, so like, and that's what I would use the backstory for is I have a personality trait. I want to, you know, show off. How did it start? Okay. Why that is that really important? Cool. All right. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think a lot of times when I write my backgrounds, I, um, I try to make sure that I don't explain everything. Hmm that I give the DM opportunities to find places to hook plot to my background mm -hmm. and look at the things going on in the game and find ways to take, take the two and, and take things from my background and put it into the game. Now with a module that, like I said, that's a much harder thing for a DM to do, but like for curse of Strahd, that's going to take you from level one to level 10. Yeah. In theory, you still have a level 11 to level 20. So yeah. what's going to happen when Curse of Strahd's done, if you want to continue playing? Your DM's going to need material now. Unless it picks up another module and dumps mm -hmm. you from one module into the next module, he's going to need material. So he's going to start at that point really needing to see, like, well, where do they go? What do they do from here? And now your background may become incredibly more important as to what he throws into the game after that point. Right. Okay. So you got to, in my opinion, you, you got to like be thinking like life after Strahd. Okay. <laughs> should, should your character live you yeah, know, good life luck. after Strahd? <laughs> so, Is it generally acceptable to include other campaigns in your backstory? So would what I have gone through in Curse of Strahd now be part of my backstory? Well, I, by the, the time you get to level 11, it will be. It'll be your story now. It's not even a backstory. It's just your story. Right. So, you know, you mean a lot of times when you think of your backstory, you're thinking about prior to game session one, what got you to mm -hmm. level one. So you talk about like where you grew up, you know, as we always like to joke, nobody's character's parents are ever all alive. It seems like it's like everyone's got Batman syndrome, you know, yeah. like yep. everyone, you can't be a hero if your parents fire. are alive, you know, so, yeah, totally something. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you, you, you talk about like if you're part of a, an order, like if you're like part of a religious order or a, a rogues okay. um, guild, you know, anything like that, like those things, you, you throw all those things in there and they may not come out and play during your module. But like I said, you get the level, you get through Curse of Strahd and he's like, let's keep playing. Now you're like, well, okay, he may pull your thieves guild out mm -hmm. if you're in one or, you know, as a, as a ranger, your tribe that you came from, okay. you know, you're a tabaxi, you're actually a native race of Barovia. 
you're not pulled in from the mist from some other realm, technically. I'm pretty sure oh. Tabaxi are native to that world. So your tribe, if you have one, is somewhere in Ravenloft, potentially. Oh, I did <laughs> so, not know that. Yeah, that's their doesn't race. Have to be, it be. doesn't have to be, but I mean, the Tabaxi, I believe, are supposed to be native to that. How come that there aren't setting? any then? Because in that particular area, I just don't know if they use them in that oh, okay. story any. But to my knowledge, I believe that that race comes from the. Okay, from it the, comes from uh, like those the mountains it's, or anything like it's that. It's a it's a race I believe they added for that campaign. So oh, okay. news to me. So, uh, we do have some chat going on here. It's pretty lively. Uh, so they're talking about ways that they've done their backgrounds, and it looks like uh, Two Socks Five has uh, said they went from writing pages and pages like I did uh, down to just describing like a major event and how that would influence their further decisions. And uh, Crazy Ike's talking about um, how he likes to give just enough information for the DM to work with, but like include names and places and kind of let that go. And, and I think what you were saying earlier, Dustin, is really important that like uh, a lot of players have a tendency to write and then close the story yeah, at the same time. That. And so there's you're basically like, oh, this stuff happened, but it doesn't happen anymore. You know, like this person was in my life and they're gone. My parents are dead. I don't have any relationships with my friends. I don't have any ties to the world. Like, okay, well, why did you tell and, me about them? You know, <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and I like to take like a classic, like figure that everybody knows. And you think about how you would write his backstory. Take like Luke Skywalker. Okay. If, if you were playing Luke Skywalker, you wouldn't write like my father became Darth Vader. You'd be like, my father was in the wars and died because that's what Uncle Owen told him. So that's right. what he believes, right? You go into the right. game, okay. what your character believes is the truth. And okay. what you do is you leave the possibilities out there that your DM can take, and then you meet Obi-Wan Kenobi, and suddenly your background's a lie. Obi-Wan says, no, your father was a Jedi Knight. He wasn't just some soldier in the war. You're like, oh, my dad was a Jedi Knight. This is great. Jesus Spoiler alert. Oh, out. man. <laughs> okay. You know? And then by... By level 10, you find out he ain't dead. He's that dude over there in the metal suit that everyone hates, you know? <laughs> He's <laughs> so, a big bad guy. Right, right. So that's your DM at work taking your background. He's like, oh, look, kid's living with his uncle on some weird planet. Like, let's make it, let's make something cool with this whole thing. He doesn't know what happened to that. And I'm going to take that character and make it the big bad end guy, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, those are that's the progression of how you take a backstory and you let your DM work with it, you know? And, yeah. and you can, it, it, that's the kind of thing you can do with a with a character background you leave those those things open-ended mm -hmm. and what just allow the allow that what you wrote to actually be a lie mm -hmm. there's other important things too to consider part of the backstory's job in my opinion um and, and other people may have some different de definitions of it but it, to me it's how did i get to the point where i'm an adventurer like why am i an adventurer because like most people aren't adventurers right Right. Like you go through the world of D and D, uh, and you know you got farmers. You say, "Hey, go kill the uh, the Jabberwocky in the corner." You're like, um, I'm going to go over there and hang out with the hay. <laughs> you know, like yeah. so. Like, what makes you different? Like, where are you going in life that you're deciding to pick up a backpack and just go roam into dungeons? You know, kill dragons, come back to a town only briefly to buy some equipment, maybe stay in an inn. Like, you're basically like a roadie. <laughs> you know. Right. Like, so like, how did you end up in that position? You know, and I, I think it's really important. Like we talked about this with the LARP setting, you know, with people making characters that have no interest in politics, no desire to actually be at social events. They want to be alone. So why did you play that character? <laughs> because that's yeah. literally what this game is about. So how did you end up here? Your backstory is a little bit mismatched. So as a player, I think it's really important to write yourself into the story in some fashion, even if you don't know what the story is going to be, yeah. you need, lead, need to have enough of a, uh, a road, you know, for you to at least come into the scene, you know? Okay. So do you generally start from childhood in your backgrounds? You can't. Not always. Not always. Okay. Not always. Okay. Yeah. My, my most recent character, well, I'm playing Bauer and Herbis right now. And I just described that he came from a standard wood elf society. So his, his upbringing would, unless you would know, he's brought up like a wood elf, would be out in the woods, hanging with his druid parents, who are still alive. I did not kill my parents <laughs> in my backstory. They're still alive somewhere. But um, he just didn't like that life. And he wanted to be out on the ocean. And he wanted to be out on the seas. And so he left his home before he went through the 
rights to become a druid like his parents were, and he became a druid of a different circle of druids mm. and joined them instead mm. because they fit more of what he wanted. And there's other parts to it, but you know, not to go into too much detail there. But in general, that's you know what uh, that's basically what uh, what it is. So okay, yeah. so then for my character in particular, you could say something like. Well, why are you a ranger? Well, then you can say, well, exactly. yeah. my people are a nomadic hunter-gatherer tribe. So it just, all of my family and friends are also rangers, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, you could do that. And then you mm -hmm. talk about maybe a little bit more about why they're a nomadic tribe or, yeah. you know, how these or... sort of things come to be. And then that could maybe then play off of your alignment as well. And it's how you interact with other characters. Either. So, like, I said that my character is, um, she's a little awkward. Mm -hmm. Like, she's not awesome in social situations. So, and I kind of said that was because she's only familiar with a small group of people. So, I could totally flesh that out a bit more. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. as far as playing off of your campaign, mm -hmm. what... Um, what tips, like for Curse of Strahd, what sort of things might have been important in my backstory to sort of bounce off of the campaign? Like the way that gotcha. I interact in inns or the way that I interact with well, bosses or... I yeah. think now you're getting into more of what the actual, what are you going to role play in the game? Yeah. Right. You're not talking about what you're writing in your backstory as much as you're talking about what you're actually going to do in the game. We're going to yeah. definitely touch on that some. I think in um, terms of what you write in your backstory, like things you can flesh out as far as like you have favored enemy undead. Mm -hmm. I that's think an that's thing, an important definitely. thing. You have to figure out why you're so yeah. good at killing undead. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are a nomadic tribe of people, but you know, that's fine. But why are you encountering so many undead? The good, it could be because you guys are from Barovia. Yeah. You're, you're, you're from either. Ravenloft. So it would make sense. You, you live in a world that's packed more than most places with undead okay. yeah and it so, could be that you're you're well versed on them that you've studied them it could be that you have a hatred for them for some reason it's so like a ranger okay. that's that's kind of their their main shtick right like what's right. the the train that they're really specialized in so like where are you from essentially and your um, pet. in your case your pet like what's your relation to them where do they come from what are they like and then yeah. what's your favorite enemy and why you know and so like okay. You know, it could literally just be, I'm a specialist. I know about these guys. I study them in books. I'm like, nah, I like to fight those guys. I just know that mm -hmm. my stuff, I know where their weaknesses are. Or it could be, yeah, a vampire came into our, our village and killed my, you know, cousins. And I, you know, vow of vengeance and I studied up on them and I've hunted them down. And, you know, I've okay. been killing their like underlings and now I find myself here. Okay. Or my, my people weren't always nomadic. We had a village in a town that got ransacked by zombies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that makes I sense. mean, there's all kinds of ways you can put that in there, like why these people are such a focal point, why those enemies are such a focal point of all your 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 existence. Like, why are they the bane of your your life? Yeah, and then also, like you were saying, um, you're thinking your your village may be all rangers, right? Well, are they yeah. all rangers, or just most of them are rangers? Is that? Yeah, so if you have a village, you would have some rangers, but then you'd also mm -hmm. have some people who, I mean, you're probably not going to have farmers if you're a bit nomadic, mm -hmm. but yeah, so I could write that mm -hmm. in there and like, who taught me to be a ranger? That mm -hmm. sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, you're hunters, gatherers, you know, you have, you have tribe elders, you know, whatever. It's kind of, yeah. What was a ranger a noble thing to be? Like, do people like value rangers or is it just kind of like, you're just another person, you know? Okay. Are there like spiritual leaders in your group or are you more secular in nature? Um, are you more attuned to just the world in like the Native American sense of like, oh, there's, you know, a tree over there is the sun. I care about the river. Or are you more, you know, specifically into like the more esoteric stuff or, you know, there's a lot of different things you can consider about being an outlander. You know, it doesn't yeah. just have to be, yeah, I don't live in a city. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I sleep on the sure. rocks, you know? Okay. And, and then, like, you, how do you view other people that aren't right. from that lifestyle? Right. And so what this say, will do... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim, go ahead. Sorry. I thought you were finishing up there. And I'm never going to finish up. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is that what these things do is that those give you your foundations by which you can then develop your play. Okay. Because once you know those things, now you have 
you have a foothold of I'm in this situation. Here's what my character would do. Here's what she would say. Here's how she would act, you know, and then if you want to go further with it, like I said, then you develop a voice, you develop mannerisms so you can describe things, you know, that she's doing. So you're not just doing it. You can describe how she does it. Okay. Like and those are things you can do that'll help build your, your sense of your character and your sense of your role play going forward from your backstory. Yeah. And I would say anything in your backstory should be something that informs your play. So like I wouldn't include anything that's not going to come up, right? Like, do you need to start from, I was born, I was an infant. I had a little bit of like five hairs on my head. <laughs> they were yellow, you know, like, but later they turned brown, you know, like I, we don't need to know that. Right. Mm -hmm. But so I, I would yeah. focus on childhood stuff. If your childhood was something that was formative, you know, okay. so like Batman, you need to know about Batman's childhood. Right. You know, he grew up in a mansion. He had a butler. His parents died at a theater. You know, like that's important to who Batman becomes. But if you didn't have anything crazy happen in your childhood, we don't need to know about it. <laughs> right. You know, we can assume you had parents, <laughs> you know, like. Right. Uh, so I would say really just focus on what you think is going to be important to understand about your character. And what are the questions that are open ended based on the choice you made in character selection. And that depends on how you built your character. In your case, you've already got a character established on a sheet, and now you're going back and adding a story to it. And you may do the opposite approach in future games where you create the story and then make a sheet to reflect it. So right. let me move around and make my camera freak out here, apparently. <laughs> Come on, focus. <laughs> oh, I did go out of, there it goes. There it goes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I would say that, that that's where I would focus. In, in your case, obviously, we already have things on your sheet that we can look at. Mm -hmm. And with fifth edition, which I'm assuming is what you're playing yep. uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, they've they've done some things I really like. So they've introduced ideals, bonds, flaws, and what's what's the other one called? Um, ideals, right? Ideals, you bonds, said. flaws. Um, oh yeah, I don't remember. Something else. I don't remember. There's another part of that sheet, yeah. But anyway, oh, inspiration maybe or something like that. But anyway, those things I think are really valuable, like understanding what those personality traits are, how they reflect on the things you're doing. Um, you know, the bond in particular would be like, you know, what is important to you? Like, is your society really important to you? Are certain members is uh, impressing your family, leaving a, a legacy? You know, what are hooks and vulnerabilities that your DM can play off of that will make it a scene matter to your character? Because that's another thing that's really important is understanding how to put yourself in a scene in a way that you're not just a player in a scene. Your yeah, character is right. alive in the scene and re reacting to the scene. Yeah. And, and that'll kind of help, like I said, bridge us into our, our next topic that we're going to kind of get into. How to both in yourself and, and with your group. And those are the kinds of things that, that I think that you really have opportunities to, um, you know, uh, I think that once you have those things set up, like I said, you can really kind of push for, for more role play. And yeah. some of that is going to start with player to player talk, mm -hmm. not character to character talk. That's it's at a table. If you're the only one really doing it, you probably won't do it long because you're not going to get any response from anyone. Yeah, yeah so it's hard. You're not, you're just playing by yourself then kind of, <laughs> you know, but um, if you want to encourage it, you do have to kind of be the person to start doing it also. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so you talk to your other players in your DM, like, and see if you can get them to, to work with you. But there's some things that you can explain to them and have them do that'll help bring it out in everybody. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of things that, you know, I think will kind of segue into like what we can have you do. And I think we can work with your Tabaxi a little bit specifically Yay. to help you with some ideas here as well. Um, I Did think you want to go get that power cord, man. I can, I, uh, I can keep things moving. I can't. She won't, let me, she won't let me up in the room. She's mad at me. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then we'll. Uh, this isn't just my seat right now. This is probably my bed for the night. This little couch. <laughs> in the lobby, so. Oh, no. But, uh, it'll be yeah. okay. Um, well, so we'll, we'll, go with, we'll go as long as I can. Um, well, let's, let's keep pushing <laughs> in then. So, yeah. for, um, like I was saying, for some of the role play parts of what you can do. I think that, um, I mean, you, we were just showing what well, you didn't show anyone here yet, but you have a cat. Yes, I do. So I you're, at. you're very familiar with things that cats do. Well, she's right behind me actually. She's right there. So you're she's very familiar. <laughs> you're very familiar with the things that cats do. Yes. 
So you know what their their general mannerisms are. You know, now you're not a house cat. Your character isn't. Your character is a mountain lion or a a lynx or something. You know, they always have there's it's different snow part. leopard. Snow leopard. There we go. So <laughs> you you may have to look up a little bit about snow leopard if they have any special qualities or traits to them. But in general, as felines, there's things they do. They'll circle around before they sit. They'll okay. clean themselves with their paws, lick their paws, and clean themselves that way. They they do a lot of those sorts of mannerisms that you can bring out in your character by describing. Like mm-hmm. you can say, "I move thirty feet this direction." Or you can right. use descriptive words like, you know, she bounces this direction, she jaunts this direction, she darts this direction. Like mm-hmm. you can you can start using more flavorful words to describe okay. what is already your standard movement or standard action. The way that mm-hmm. she draws back her bow, um, you know, uh, like I said, there's there's little things like that you can, just in the descriptive way that you describe your normal round around actions. Yeah, and that's really the way I would start with a group who's not familiar with role playing. Like, like he was saying, if you don't have a group that's already established in that, that's not used to role playing, then probably, like you said, the best place to start is in just slowly encouraging description, getting more description from your DM, um, kind of just describing how you react to your environment a little bit aside from just what you're doing. Okay, so instead of saying something like, "I use my heavy crossbow on." Mm-hmm this vampire standing mm-hmm. right here i would say something like you know cloud noiselessly moves 10 feet to the right and mm-hmm. then picks up her heavy crossbow and carefully aims and lets the bolt loose you yeah know, because just yeah, simple, yeah. simply mm-hmm. describing what you're doing instead of you know necessarily like voice to voice but yeah mm-hmm. that would be a great way to start i think because a lot and- of times what we do is we ask can mm-hmm. I do this? Mm-hmm. Can I um, can I put my hunter's mark on that vampire? Mm-hmm. You know, we we ask a lot of things, and he's like, "Yep." So I think that now that we've started playing, and we 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 understand the basics of how to play. I think mm-hmm. now we can instead of being like a lot of times we try to also um as new players we try to get as much of the DM as we possibly can. Yep. We'll say, "Well, would you allow me to do this?" Instead mm-hmm. of just trying it, mm-hmm. and then the DM saying, uh, you fell on your face. Right. Or, yeah. you know, something like that. And I think that's something, now that we have a better understanding of the game, that I think that we should do a lot more of. And I would really like to do mm-hmm. more of that. And I want to get into this role play. And I think mm-hmm. what you, this suggestion is exactly what I needed. Okay. I'm really excited to try I'll that tell you, next campaign. I'll tell you something else you can do. And everyone forgets this. A lot of people forget this in D&D. You have an action, a move action, a bonus action, and a reaction. What people forget is you have a free action. You know what free action that is? Talk. <laughs> you can say something. You can interject lines of of character voice into your combat rounds. A lot of people, okay. initiative gets rolled, they shut that off. They yeah. forget all about it. It's what what mechanical actions can I take? My action okay. this round is I move here. I take my action shot, I take my bonus action, and it's not my turn anymore. Mm-hmm. And what you could do is, is you can take those actions and also say, you know, you can put in a role play line, use your character voice if you've got one built, you know, mm-hmm. take this evil fiend, drop, you know, mm-hmm. a thing into it. You can add, you can add that flavor back in there. And that was okay. one thing you were saying earlier with uh, the description of the crossbow, right? Like you use the word quick or carefully take your shot right Mm -hmm. and there's a big difference if we said that entire line exactly the same but instead of carefully we said quickly right there's a different there's a different character there yeah you know and it's just just one word you know it doesn't really seem like it should be that big but it makes a big difference to the table around you and Mm -hmm. i think when you have like a huge group of people you know like you're saying seven players there's kind of a tendency as a player to be like okay i want to get my turn done so that everyone else goes around and then you go okay people are taking their turns (sighs) <sighs> that's exactly yeah. what happens a lot. Right? And, <laughs> and that's so when you start like, talking to people in your stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like seven rounds until I come up again. Hell, so yeah. what's up, guys? Hey. Right, exactly. exactly. So I think the important thing is if you start doing these descriptions in a way they're actually entertaining to your, your fellow player, they're going to pay attention to what you're doing. You're going to pay attention to what they're doing. And then you start to play off of each other a little bit 
even if you aren't doing yeah. voices, even if you aren't doing backstories, even if you aren't really getting into dialogue, you're now at least creating a scene and you're co storytelling at that point with the DM. You know, they're describing the scene to you. You're describing your part of it and how you fit into it. And it paints a better picture of it overall. Yeah. So something um, I always wondered. So say I, I do you guys do your role play before or after you roll? Because I'm thinking about what you just mm -hmm. said with careful and mm -hmm. quickly. Maybe mm -hmm. I, I roll my dice. And before the DM tells me if I even hit, I would just say, like cloud like say I, I rolled poorly i would say cloud moves this way and then i'm gonna roll and say my i know i say i roll like a six mm -hmm. you know obviously i'm gonna whiff it i could say something like cloud hurriedly points her crossbow in a random direction and shoots and then the dm would say something like you completely miss and your bolt lodges in the wall behind them mm -hmm. but that would add a lot more flavor to yeah. a crappy roll you know instead of just being like <sighs> I miss, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, important the, to have a talk with your DM. So okay. like uh, we had an earlier uh, wisdom check about uh, where players or DMs have control, right? Like whose story is it anyway kind of thing. Yeah. And so like, you know, I would have a dialogue with the DM and say, hey, like I'm interested in doing this style. You know, obviously you, you're going to do a little bit of narration of what happens with me and tell me how things play out too. Are you okay with me starting off with this? You know, what I assume is happening. And if they're cool with that, Go with it, you know. Okay. If they're like, nah, let, let me describe what happens, you know, then okay. you know, it's their they're the DM. <laughs> okay. So then would you if you did roll poorly, would you not describe your action at that point in time? Or would you only describe your action after the DM tells you that's a hit? Roll for damage. Um or how how would you do hmm. it or suggest that you you work on these action sort of it really well, depends. It, it depends on your group. Like I, I think, like in our group, uh, our DM likes to describe the action, you know, like and, and the aftermath of the action. Okay. Uh, so like we tend to kind of leave it to him to do some of it. Um, I think when you know what's going on for sure, like you know, I know what this guy's AC is. I know I hit or missed for sure. Then you can kind of inject something to it. Uh, but I think as a player, sometimes we have a tendency to uh, declare things happen or not happen when we don't actually have that agency to decide that. <laughs> Apparently, we're going on a magic we journey. Are, we're going, going on a magic <laughs> journey to my room. This awesome. is going to be fascinating uh, Twitch streaming right here. As I try <laughs> this a is an IRL stream. We're this IRL is, streaming now. We are. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it's really, that, that's a discussion to have, I think, with your particular okay. group. It's going to be different from one group to the other. Um, now, I think if you do have the okay, yeah, describe it up. You know, like, uh, I would be careful of like, well, we apparently lost him. I would be careful in what we describe, you know, like, again, because we don't know the outcomes of things. Just your own action, basically. Like, you would mm -hmm. just say, like, your intention. Where, how, your intention. Okay, mm -hmm. so then... You know, you could say either quickly or hurriedly or carefully, and maybe it doesn't matter if I would carefully did this or not. I still failed. But mm -hmm. then the DM decides how that plays off of what I said, basically. Yeah. So you could be like, she uh, effortlessly and silently slinks from one corner to the next. She takes cover behind the pillar and she lines up her shot carefully. And as she pulls her trigger, <laughs> roll the dice. Hey, I rolled a seven. DM says, oh, well, you know, you let loose the bolt and it flies towards the enemy and it shakes off to the side of the wall and slides down the, you know, the hallway clattering, okay. you know. So at that point, you're kind of sharing it. Uh, like Jay Bruce is talking about in the chat here. Uh, we have actually had a lot of chat tonight. It's really good. Um, chat. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. Uh, we apparently have uh, may or may not have lost Dustin. So maybe uh, become a just you and me talk for a little while. Uh, but they're talking about uh, scenes that are interesting. So like uh, the Princess Bride. Um, you know, a duel, you know, there's a lot of combat banter there. It's a good example there of, you know, you could just have a fight, but then you have that interesting back and forth kind of dialogue that really sells that scene. And then Jay Bruce is talking about as a GM or DM, he likes to allow RP moments to ignore dice, depending on the situation, uh, particularly charisma checks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Charisma is one of those particularly interesting ones, you know, like, um, depending on your group and how they feel about it, uh, you know, people like to role play. So 
if you role play with me and your role play is good and I'm convinced, a lot of people will be like, yep, you succeed, you know? Okay. Even if you got a character who's like, I've got a negative seven in my charisma, you know, like. Yeah, I have like a negative eloquent. one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a little double edged. Like I am. In theory, I want the game to play by the rules, you know, and we definitely lost him there. Oh. Um, well, that's going to screw up our stream for a second, guys. We'll get that Oops. squared up in a moment. Uh, <laughs> hopefully he comes back. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll hold down the fort. It'll be fine. Uh, but, you know, I would say with the uh, charisma checks, I, I have a tendency to want the dice to dictate what's happening because it's a game. But okay. as a player, I like role play to trump stuff, you know, because yeah. that's what I enjoy the most. So it, it really, again, that's another one of those what is this social contract like at your table? You know, like, okay. ha have you talked this out ahead of time with the other people around your table? And at this point, you're a new group. So you may be kind of forming relationships and understanding the dynamics between you and the other players and you and the DM. And if your DM's new, they're still trying to figure out what it is to be a DM. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are probably in flux that you're trying to work out. Right. So just a lot yeah. of conversations to have. Do you have suggestions for role playing with a massive group like this? So we have such a huge group, but then we also have like, like I'm playing my character, but mm -hmm. I'm also playing my, my pet character. Mm -hmm. And then we have our DM who's playing all the enemies, but mm -hmm. also playing as Irina. And then wow, also, they added an extra character in as yeah, an NPC. Yeah, because we're, we're escorting Irina. And so <laughs> oh he's, God. we've been escorting her for like six months now. So we decided to finally make her a character for a little while. So Wowzer. And it's nice so that he can actually like do a little bit of play like that but mm -hmm. um it's, it's also i don't want to hog the spotlight also yeah so then it's hard to know how to work with such a large group well yeah we we touched on this a little bit in an earlier wisdom check uh and it really everything seems to boil down to the same answer it's social contract you know what have you talked about with your group and so I would encourage having a talk with your group at some point, figure out what the other players are like, what motivates them. Are they the type of people that want to be in the forefront? Do they want the stage time? Do they want to be the person that's just kind of there? Okay. You know, like, because yeah. everyone's different, you know, like some people really like to get chatty and some people are really nervous about that, uncomfortable about that. Maybe they just want to insert a little word here or there. And, you know, you, I don't want to throw those guys out there on the stage and be like, act, go, you know? Hey, that Hi. looks like he might be back. Uh, Hi, we're, back. Welcome we're, back. <laughs> welcome back. We're driving Clint crazy tonight with the overlays. So <laughs> he's like, oh my god. Luckily, he had him prepped. So. Super fast, though. Yeah, dude, he, he is. is he's amazing. Got him. He's, I told you, he's a tech guy. He does everything. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Tech he does a good job. <laughs> he does a good job. So, uh, so what you missed? Uh, we were talking about how to deal with large groups and uh, finding. Yeah time to actually interject role playing share the the uh <laughs> the the stage time <laughs> yeah pulling hair out yeah sorry about that buddy um, thanks man <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think it really comes down to like we were saying before in earlier wisdom checks going back and having that talk with the group and saying what sure. motivates each of the players how much time do they want on the stage versus how much time do they want to hang back in the background um you know how much of emphasis should role playing be in your game are a lot of the players just hack and slash players? Mm. Are you a group of people that want to act? You know, what's the distribution in your group? That's going to dictate a lot of how much time should be devoted to role playing. And, you know, if you that end up finding sense. that your group doesn't want to do the stuff you want to do, maybe it's a sign that you may need to find another group. Yeah. You know, I think that with our next group or campaign type thing, um, I would certainly look for a a group that has similar ideals and maybe my group does mm -hmm. and I just don't know that yet but mm -hmm. I certainly the next time say say my group completely dissolved and I had to look for a new group I think I would have a better checklist of things mm -hmm. that I really wanted in a group and what yeah. I I was trying to get out of a group and I think now that I have this experience and even just this little bit of talking with you guys tonight has really helped me to see exactly what it is that I'm looking for in a group and how to play That's off awesome. that now. Well, yeah, I'm really glad to hear that, you know, because I mean, this is stuff we didn't just like understand ahead of time, because like when we first started playing, man, we were our we were, early characters were horrible. <laughs> yeah. We didn't understand role playing. We didn't understand backstories. Uh, 
we really didn't understand anything about gaming in general. It was just power fantasies and like, you know, hack and slash and finding cool loot. And it was collecting cool items. It was very <laughs> much in the same way that you approach. Wow. It really was like, yeah. okay. it's like, all right, so we'll just go kill some more monsters. And then eventually I'll get some cool armor to go with this cool sword. Right? Like that's how the mm -hmm. game works. Right? So yeah, the secret out, sauce yeah. I find is failing a lot. Yeah. And keeping at it, really paying attention to what went wrong and building off of that. And I think that's true in life in general. I get to get a little philosophical about things, but you know, like in gaming that's in particular, <laughs> yeah. but in gaming in general, I think everything that I've come to figure out over time has been something I've screwed up <laughs> you know, as a DM, as a player, uh, as groups, um, you know, like stepping on the, the limelight, you know, in the group, that's a big problem when you're first stepping out into it. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm on the stage. Cool. Let's go. And, uh, you know, it's very important to leave a door open, a little space for other people to come in. Gotcha. I gotcha. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. for me, it, I do worry about talking too much and like over, overdoing it, you know, uh, like a, even with my own, like, if I'm going to investigate a lot of times, it'll just be like the one person investigating, right. Or mm -hmm. exploration. That's mm -hmm. one thing that, um, you know, is tough for our group too. We have two rogues. They want to oh, yeah. oftentimes go out and explore, but then we're like, well, if each one of them goes in a different way and explores something different, mm -hmm. who can spend 20 minutes with the rest of us sitting there doing literally nothing while the DM talks to one rogue and explains what they see and then talks to the other and rogue and explains what they see. So Some of that's unavoidable. Yeah. Even in a smaller group with us, mm -hmm. it happens. Like we were just, we were just kind of joking a little about like we, we had a, hour and a half like shopping scene where skis are mm -hmm. there bought bought scrolls me me and clint we, we didn't say a word for that like hour yeah you know like we just didn't like our characters didn't really have any good reason to go up there and chat it up with these things we were just hanging down there on the beach he was doing what he needed to do and we understand it on a player level he needed those scrolls so he was doing this bartering scene it was a good scene nothing wrong with it at all mm -hmm. excellent scene levi did some fantastic voices our dm did, did some yeah, fantastic okay. work if you watch it it's totally amusing to you because you're a viewer. You're you're investing yeah. in all of it. As as us as players, though, we're just kind of sitting there, like you're uh, like, you know, we're like, all right, you know, are they done? <laughs> I got I got other things on my other monitor. I'm sitting there working on. I'm typing in the stream chat. You know, like I've got other things right. to do in there, but right. I'm not doing any role playing at that point. And with a stream situation, like I can't yeah. have a sidebar conversation. With That's what them. I was going to get to. Like that because was because we talk over the people that are doing the actual scene itself. So it's really yeah. hard on stream to have those sidebar conversations. We're at a table. I would have pulled Kodo aside. Me and Bowron and Kodo would have had a heart to heart that no mm -hmm. one else needed to hear, but us, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. We had a lot of this, uh, back in the day when we were at a table, right? Like I ran an exalted game. We probably had seven players. I was at any given night. And so I would pull like a player off. We do a little side scene. Other players are doing scenes with each other. And that was an opportunity okay. for them to role play and interact or, you know, Hey, you know, like, what are you guys thinking? What are you guys talking about? What are your plans are and stuff. And so we, I, I feel like we got really used to having that as a possibility. Hey, we got some bits. Hey, thank you. Two socks. We five. did two socks. And so you're headed to bed. Thanks for stopping in. I appreciate it. Two socks is one That's of awesome. the, uh, one of the fantastic players over at dad bod D and D. Oh, no oh, kidding. Nice. They are currently, I'm going to put a little plug in for them real quick. They're currently recruiting players for one shots. So if nice. you want to try a one shot, get in their discord, tell them you're there for the one shots. They will set up a time and place where you can play a one-time game with them and other people around the community. So they're currently working cool. on doing that stuff. So that's Ooh. so weird. Definitely you just that. that. I so literally was just talking to my DM we, about that yeah. doing one and shot. So I, awesome. um, if you're in, you're in my discord already, I know that in Aravia. So yeah. if you check out in there, I just put a link they under uh, the promote yourself thing where you'll be able to find uh Billy and people awesome. need to talk I to certainly you. I'm going to try to get in on that. So. Hey, Jay Bruce, yeah, thanks for that sub, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jay Bruce, for the like sub. It's like raining good stuff all of a sudden. It is. Jay Bruce is going to be a guest on a Wisdom Check in a couple weeks. So you, awesome. You awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so anyway, like with the side scene stuff, that I think that's – we got really used to that in person. Yeah. You know, so I, I okay. really miss that. But once we made the translation into online uh, format, like you were saying, it, even in this conversation here with only three of us, it's really hard not to step on each other. And you definitely cannot have cross table talk. So right. you do end up in these scenes where it's just a lot less manageable. So I would think um, if I were putting together a group specifically for heavy role play, I would want a smaller group. 
if I was doing it online. If I'm doing it online and I have a big group, that's an X's and O's game. Yeah. Yeah, it it, it really can be. It's And it definitely, I think that the other thing that you'll get better at doing as you do the role play more and what your players will get better at doing too is finding ways to hook other players into what's Mm -hmm. going on. Like your rogue may want to explore and investigate and he can sit there and just have a conversation with the DM about everything he's seeing and finding. Mm -hmm. But like he's looking, he's seeing stuff, something's written there. Maybe he knows the language, but he could also turn to the wizard and be like, you, smart guy, come Mm -hmm. here. You know, read this for me. Read this. Okay. Like, just because he finds it doesn't mean he has to keep it, hold on to it, and it's his yeah. to deal with. You can bring other people in, you know, and like, that's super hey, weird. I can read languages. He's better at it than me, though. Come over here and I read gotcha. this thing for real. Like, I don't want to mess it up. Like, and there's things you can do like that. So. Yeah, we kind of did that. Um, so right now we are in the mansion, um, Argenvoss Holt, I think is its name. And so we have a, a dragon born in our party i also can read and speak draconic but it's his native language so we kind yeah. of deferred to him to do anything that involved draconic mm-hmm. um and so I, I can definitely see what you mean when you're doing things like that you you can draw other players in and let them sort of have the spotlight there like mm-hmm. maybe what other options would you have would it be maybe more type um like their class yeah, or like so class and languages yeah. and things like that. Well, or let me what other show options? you guys something real quick. Uh, where's that book at? Oh, he's got props. <laughs> we, knew he was, we didn't know we were having props today. <laughs> All right. So this is the new Exalted Third Ed, right? This freaking behemoth of a book. That's a big book. <laughs> wow. Most of this is mechanics, right? It's ridiculous. But they have this huge section in, the, in there about how to reward role-playing points. And okay. what I really like about it is it encourages you at the end of the session to sit down and talk to your players and say, okay, what was drawn from your backstory? What time did you encourage somebody else to shine in their moment? Like you have a guy who's like the big warrior dude. Well, there was a scene where a duel could happen. Did you guys defer to him to be that or her to be that person in that moment? Or did the rogue guy step up and say, no, I'm going to do the duel, you know? Um, and there's a lot of times, uh, like I, I brought this up in the past, like I had a character that was pretty self-sufficient. He could do a lot of things. And a lot of times he can do those things better than the class that was specialized in it. And at those times, I made the mistake of saying, I'm going to do it because I'm better at this. Mm. You know, instead of letting that person who had their niche fill their niche. Okay. And I so gotcha. that's, you know, a lesson you learn over time, you know, to make sure that you're encouraging other people into the game. And, uh, like right now, one of the things that's going on is, um, I've been sitting on this, uh, issue with skeezer, my, uh, my character in our D and D game. And he's got a weird tattoo on his back that moves around. There's like a mystery of why there are multiple characters that look exactly like him, and they all have the same tattoo, but they look different. And it's like a whole Aww. scene that I wouldn't check out. My character believes that it's like an existential issue though. Like if somebody fiddles with this, I could die. So like. He's been real secretive about it. And as a player, I, that makes sense to me. But from the how do I inject this into the group, right. I have to be willing to say, hey, you know what? Let's, uh, let's take a risk here. Let's bring in the guy I don't really trust into the scene because it's going to create an interesting role play element. Okay. And then again... Sometimes you have to take a risk. Oh, just, you always have to take a you risk. You always okay. have to take a risk all the time. Like, yeah. And I the, think that sometimes... like. I think as people in general, and some people are this way and it's a bad thing, but like we have a tendency to avoid drama in our lives. Whenever somebody gets to, when their life becomes too drama, we kind of distance ourselves from them. Mm -hmm. We push aside a little bit and we're like, you do you. And when you figure it out, you come back and we can hang again. Right? Like you, people have a tendency to push it away. But I think sometimes when you're trying to do story, like you have to think about ways to ramp up a little of that drama. You got to find ways to, to be that person that'll that'll have that'll create the scene a little bit now and then mm-hmm. like especially if there is a lull and there isn't much else kind of going on be that person to to put a little adrenaline back into the party again yeah because nobody yeah. wants to watch the movie where nothing happens right right, <laughs> right. That makes sense that really makes sense because yeah. you, you guys are 100 right like you don't 
generally want to do things that could have negative outcomes mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. generally at least so like i tend to play very cautiously mm -hmm. but yeah. that's really boring and um, we 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 have people in our party who do that too they're very cautious so i'm the one who's not i'm the guy who will just walk out there and just stab something like i'm i'm that guy so yeah <laughs> we do have two characters in particular that i think about that um they do things that we're like no 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 Oh, it's too late. And I mm -hmm. like that actually, because, well, unfortunately one time it caused somebody to die, but like one of our, our, our tiefling warlock in death house was like, what is this orb? The, as soon as the DM described it, he's like, I'm going to pick it up. And we're like, ah, and as soon as he did it, like <laughs> enemies just swarmed the room. And, we're like, yeah. and he's just like, right. hey. but if everyone's cautious, you know what happens yeah. if everyone's cautious? Yeah. You make 5,000 no. perception and investigation checks, and you all stand there looking at the orb for an hour or more. Mm -hmm. Before you decide. Yeah, and, and even I... if you're role-playing, you're talking about what the orb might do. Mm -hmm. well, I see arrow slits in the wall. I think arrows are going to fire out. Can we disable that mechanism? And you spend another half hour trying to disable a mechanism that may not even be there. Mm -hmm. You know, you're and you're off on this tangent, and, and mm -hmm. you just need that one person just to pick up the orb. You really do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we do have the Leroy Jenkins. We do have a Leroy Jenkins. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that is kind of another thing too with our, um, one of our rogues has more of a like questionable alignment. Mm -hmm. We don't actually know what their alignment is, but they've done a few things that have definitely caused, it's hard to know. Like, so for an example, um, in the, in the game, mm -hmm. they pickpocketed somebody, somebody important. That person then took it out on a child and killed a child. Ooh. Mm. So from Ooh. our standpoint, we're wow. like, you're a horrible person and we mm. want nothing to do with you now. And that's made role playing really difficult now, even though like they're like, no, I have a different view of this. I want to get vengeance now. So like they're not really evil. They're but... just not taking responsibility. Right. So then our character, but so then it's like hard to know when you're like, this is a person and this is a person, but these are two characters. And it's yeah. hard for me to well, really put that together right now, too. And like, like you're talking about the drama. So I yeah. kind of just want to be like, I don't want anything to do with this now. Like, right. Let's move on, you know, but it could be right. really interesting. But if you think about it in terms of everyone's most popular favorite TV show to talk about right now, Game of Thrones. Mm hmm. That show starts out with a guy who pushes a kid out of a tower. Yeah. Yeah. And by season seven, he's my favorite character. You can yeah. redeem that guy. You can. Right. You can redeem him, but he has to go through a catharsis in his yeah, role has play. To story there, he yeah. has to he has to do various things over time to show that and things have to happen to him, lose a hand, whatever it takes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> to where he eventually comes around to this point where by the end you're like, you know. I ain't gonna spoil no Game of Thrones, so I'm right. sure everyone's seen it by now. But like, by the time you get to the end, you're just like, "Don't kill that guy!" Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you 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 find yourself liking this character, then you go back and you watch season one. You're like, "I forgot how much of a douche." I fucking hate this guy. I hate yeah. Guy. Forgot like, how much I hated that guy. Right. So I mean, that makes it, so much sense, and I, I really love those that. Opportunities, like even though he did something you think is really questionable, and like all your mm -hmm. characters at the moment don't like him for it, like right. it still gives you an opportunity, and if that player. And that character want to take those opportunities, and your DM finds ways to give him those routes. He'll he might redeem himself in other ways beyond yeah. just vengeance. Vengeance is the easy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, think anytime you have that like difficult talk that's out there, and people are like, eh, I don't want to, I don't want to be the one that starts that trouble. You know, yeah, you should definitely start that trouble because like okay. it's there for a reason, right? Like, yeah, why did this character do this? They did a thing. There was a negative repercussion. If it's just out there and you just leave it there, then it doesn't mean anything. Right. Right. But it obviously mattered to the characters, right? Their alignment. <laughs> this is an opportunity to showcase your alignment, your personality of your character. It's an opportunity for them to outline theirs. And then for you to have a little, like, you don't want to have so much friction that the party disintegrates, right? Right. But up until that point, it's good to have a little bit of back and forth. Like, uh, we played a Marvel superheroes game that Levi ran. And, um, in that game, uh, I, I had never seen Civil War or read any of that series, but somehow there was like an event that took place, like mutant registration and stuff. And I accidentally fell into the Tony Stark side of the argument, and the entire rest of the group went with Captain America style. 
And we had our own civil war argument in the middle of this game where both sides were like, no, we're totally right. You know, yeah. and it was real awkward, but it was really good. You know, okay. like had a lot of opportunities to really flesh out like what those characters think, how they interact with the world, how they think of each other, whether they respect each other at that point. You know, what's the give and take? Can they still work together in spite of these problems? Um, it was really cool. And, uh, you know, I think you miss out on those opportunities if you take the easy road. Yeah. It's got to be hard to fake fight with your friends in a way. <laughs> like We have a lot of practice. That's- yeah, <laughs> that's because we real fight a lot. We real fight. A lot. We real fight a lot. Oh yeah. We, we we actually started this show because we figured we'd have arguments over topics about D and D, and it turned out we don't argue as much as we thought. Just but we we thought we were going to argue a lot. So if it was in text format, face to face is so much harder. <laughs> Man, I actually like this guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> You can't just uh, keyboard warrior it. Yeah. So again, though, this is about your table, right? So like if your group is open to having these sorts of interactions and exploration of character, then it's definitely something you should get into. If they're the group that's like, no, I want to go kick in a door and fight. God, what are you doing? Why are we talking about this kid? I don't care. I want to go fight the vampire. Then like, yeah. it's not going to pay off, you know? So right. you really have to figure out, again, no. how to talk and, and kind of sort of this- and those modules have a lot of exposition written. Mm-hmm. Like there's times where the DM has block of text that they ha- that they will read out in a scene, mm-hmm. or like you find like a journal page, and the DM will either read it to you because he has it in the book, or in your case, the DM has made some very nice graphics of it to like send to people. And I've seen yeah. those pop up. So yeah. like you guys have gotten to actually read them, which is kind of cool. And so then like you know those are those are things that because there's a lot of exposition in there, you know, you, you could find which players are your ones that are getting into that and which ones aren't. And those are the players you can kind of talk to first about getting a couple allies at the table who want to do some role play. Yeah. And if you always have that one or two pe- people that just don't really do the role play much, they just aren't going to, they'll be there for the mechanics part of it and the fighting. They're just not going to role play much. You don't try to like bend their arm too much. You find your couple, you got seven players. So the good thing about having seven players is you can find one or two that's willing to maybe do it with you there and, and do the role play stuff. You can you can get them to kind of start in on it with you a little and you'll get a little more. You may not get, you know, role play utopia out of it, but you can mm-hmm. you can push towards a better role play situation that'll make it more fulfilling for you mm-hmm. and not have to push other people out of their comfort zone as well. Well, and it is a skill yeah. like role playing is a skill. Yes. You're going to be terrible at it when you start. Uh, we were all terrible at it when we started. And yeah. uh, it takes a long time to kind of polish off the rough edges and find things at work and get comfortable with the process. You know, like yeah. we were doing voice acting last week, right? Yeah. <laughs> like we're pretty okay at it these days. But like when put on the spot during the episode, I found myself being like, hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I don't want to make the sound come out of my mouth. You know, right. like I'm like, I do this all the time. Like the next morning I woke up and it was just like 30 voices came out naturally, like super easy. It's like, damn it. <laughs> Couldn't think of one of those. <laughs> Not a single one. I was on the spot. So, you know, you got to give yourself enough room to make mistakes. Like I was saying before, uh, know that you're going to make them. It's just going to happen. Not every character is going to be amazing. It's just, they're not, you know, some of them are going to be real forgettable and you'll be like, yeah, can I get a mulligan? <laughs> yeah. um, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's just part of it. And as I was saying with the group, you know, as you kind of develop a rapport with the other players, uh, figure out what motivates them and what they are, enjoy, it gets a lot easier. Yeah. You know, for us, we just happen to have been playing together for 20 plus years. So like at this point, we know pretty much what each other are going to do, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And you can play off of each other well. So, mm-hmm. so do you think, so. You, have a, you, think <laughs> you have a couple players that you think you can get on board with? And Definitely. Definitely. I think that our DM is going to be really supportive of it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's pushed us to try to role play a bit more in some ways. And if you, if you even just give him an inch, he will run with it. So Good. there was one um, instance where we're in Argenvoss hold and mm-hmm. uh, I said, we were trying to find out any information we could. And I'm like, um, I have this book of poetry. Um, can I look in there and see if there's 
anything about Argen Vossholt. And again, this would be another thing where I'm like, can I do this? We do this all mm -hmm. the time. And it's something I'd like to just say, I want to look at this book of poetry that I picked up from the death house and see if anything is in there about Argen Vossholt. And um, he actually was, and I rolled a natural 20. And nice. then that helps <laughs> for the next, for the next um, episode. He literally wrote a poem, you guys, a long epic history poem wow. of the whole battle between Strahd and Argenvost. In, yeah, I like, saw it. It was good, right? It was good. Yeah, no, I, I saw that episode. Yeah. And I it was incredibly impressive. But you see what I mean? Like, all I did was say, like, I want to check this poetry book that I've been lugging around for six months and see if there's anything in there that could help us. And then I got something like that out of it, you know, and that was incredible. It was really great. It was absolutely, I think that's probably my favorite. <laughs> well, Invincible is pretty awesome too, but it's my second favorite part of the entire game. That's fantastic. I, it, you, it really helps to have that in your group. Like if you have a DM that's open to like creating these moments and allowing players to kind of explore, you know, different ways of solving problems and stuff, then it just opens up the creativity and like allows people to just really get out there and role play and try things. And it, you have to have that. Like if you got a gaming group where people are just always saying, no, nope, that doesn't work. Nope. Can't do that. Nope. I don't role play that way. Nope. My character wouldn't do that. Like mm, nothing yeah. cool ever happens, <laughs> you know? So right. it's awesome. You got that opportunity and had to be there. And it yeah. sounds like that's going to be a good DM. We do have a couple of characters. I know the, the, the more, questionable aligned character mm -hmm. does try some role play and does a little bit of mm -hmm. voices sometimes too nice. so i think Ooh, that we can voice. yeah she tries <laughs> so <laughs> we uh we're we're i think between the two of us and and then the one character who's sort of leroy jenkins uh we can <laughs> i think that we could squeak a little bit more out of our group um there's yeah. only maybe one one or two characters that i think are a little more mild or meek, but yeah, I now, think is that we could definitely do that the player, the player, the player mm -hmm. themselves. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes it gets a little weird to play against type too. So like, you know, somebody who's a little shy and in real life has a hard time being anything but shy in the game sometimes. And yeah, you know, it takes a while to break out of that, especially with a new group. You know, getting comfortable working with other people is not everyone's going to be. You know, some people have you know social anxiety issues uh, to begin with let alone in a <laughs> setting where they're not accustomed, you know, like role-playing in a game where they're not sure what they can do with a group of people they don't really know. <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of things that can go into it. Yeah, luckily but, uh, for our group, we... Uh, so it's me and, let's see, one, two, three, four... Act everybody except the DM and one player are all part of my World of Warcraft guild. Oh, so nice. we, uh, all, yeah. we all know each other and we have for years. Um, mm -hmm. And the DM is one player's brother, and then mm -hmm. one player is the, his friend. So there's only two players that we're unfamiliar with, but now we've been playing all together for a year. So we do know each other fairly well now. Um, and the other players, the rest of us, we've been doing, I guess, so, collective gaming mm -hmm. together in other forms for many years. I mean, four, four or five years in some cases. So. See, you know, that's what's, it, it helps. That's what's so interesting. Like when you we hear your WoW experience versus ours, because we were we were doing role playing games before WoW. So when we went into WoW, we made characters and then we stood around and role played inside the actual game. Like we mm -hmm. we did a lot of that for a long time too. So it's funny because like you probably never thought about that, but we actually. I mean, people do it. There I are just, a lot of people who do. It just, no, yeah. I yeah. never have really. Yeah. Um, some people. <laughs> I mean, there are role playing servers that people are very into it, but um, it's not common it's not very common they, they do really like their sex scenes in that inn yes they <laughs> yeah. do. just south of wherever that was yeah. uh that place called stormwind yeah gold oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 it's like god That's every time i walked by i was like oh no You're like i need to get on a different role playing server <laughs> hey guys can we go to the other continent <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah scarlet crusade yep yep, mm -hmm. yep yeah we did a lot of that um so, I mean, you, you got a little bit of a, a taste of how to kind of get things going and how to have those conversations maybe a little bit. And like you're saying in the chat here, it's definitely contagious. So like once people start role playing, it makes other people more comfortable with the idea of role playing, right? So mm -hmm. 
somebody's got to be the first one out there. And, you know, if you're comfortable trying and you're open to the idea that I'm going to be the one that takes the risk here, yeah. you're going to really set up your group to also do the same thing. Okay. You know, take the pressure off them a little bit. So I, I think you can create the conditions of a game that you want to have. Nice. It just, yeah. just takes a little bit of guts, you know. It's going to be really difficult, but I think I'll <laughs> I'll try to carry the torch. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be terrible. Uh, I, I'm sure you'll. We're be all fine. terrible. Who cares, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you just you just do what you're gonna do, and you know, you're you already stream. People are already watching you play this game. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not gonna think any less of you. At the, you know, like they're gonna they're gonna sure be like, <laughs> oh no, nah, you got a very supportive you got a very supportive uh, viewer base. I've watched them. So, yeah. At the end of the day, the consequences of failure are pretty mild. Like, some mild embarrassment. You might look a little stupid, but who cares? Fun, you know, like, right? who cares? Exactly. Everybody, gets, everybody else gets a laugh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, exactly when you hit that. your follower goal and you put on the shark suit, I mean, you're already you're halfway there. So <laughs> you're lucky I didn't give that, that to Clint. I didn't give that to Clint ahead of time to patch <laughs> that in. So what everybody a great idea. idea that now, but geez. that was the most embarrassing thing I've ever had. See, to do. So if, if you if you endure that, you can handle role play. You're good. You're good to go. Yeah. So. Brilliant. <laughs> That's so, very fair. <laughs> we were talking a little bit about your backstory ideas. You know, have you been able to think of anything that you might want to do with your character? Other than like my basic traits and stuff, I, mm -hmm. I don't really know. Um, I would like to explain. I really want to explain why, why undead? Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, because obviously the reason I chose undead is because I'm like, there's going to be a lot of undead in this campaign mm -hmm. you know because i had played the module and i knew that everybody in that house was dead yeah. so i i literally chose it for that but now i want to kind of backtrack and write out why mm -hmm. why right. undead um i'd really like to oh boy um these five pictures <laughs> i'd really like to understand um Maybe a little bit more of my character's social awkwardness. Mm -hmm. um, I think I want. I want to look at. I have all of my. I'm a little old school here, and I printed out all of my stuff so that I could think about it and write <laughs> handwritten notes on here and stuff. So yeah, I have my personality traits, my ideals, bonds, and flaws. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to elaborate those a bit more. Um, so like for example, my personality trait says I feel far more comfortable with animals than people. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Now, right. And now I know how to, I, I feel like I know how to answer some or ask these questions, but I don't really know if I know how to answer them yet. And this sets up a really interesting conversation about how to design a really good backstory to flesh out the details about your character, what's important, what's not important, and how to really just delve into what makes your character who they are. And yes, that is Naravi up there in the left shark costume. We go in and we talk a little bit about uh, what the inside joke is on that. And, uh, you know, it's a nice icebreaker there. Hope you enjoyed the episode so far. If you did, please leave a like. Subscribe if you haven't already. And obviously, support Naravia. Check out her channel. Look at what she's doing. It's great. And uh, we'll be really happy to hear any feedback from you that you may have. If you have any suggestions on future content, or if you even have questions about how to develop your character, how to develop role playing in your particular group, fire off some comments. We'll go ahead and answer them in the comments section. Until then, I'll check you later. Ta ta.